Hi, I'm Tom Hollingsworth, and welcome to the On-Premise IT Roundtable. This is a podcast that is dedicated to talking about all the hot topics in information technology. Uh, we're gathered here with a group of IT professionals that are leaders in the community and very well-known voices, and we are excited to hear what they have to say about our topic today. I'd like to have them introduce themselves, starting with Scott. My name is Scott McDermott. I blog at MostlyNetworks.com, and you can follow me at ScottM32768 on Twitter. Very good. Mine's not quite that long. Hi, I'm Richard McIntosh. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at 802TopHat, and you can find my blog at 802TopHat.wordpress.com. Uh, I'm Jeff Frag. I blog at FragGuy.net, and you can find me on Twitter at FragGuy underscore PA. I am Eric Stover. I'm a network engineer. I tweet at Eric underscore Stover and blog at 12fs.wordpress.com. Right. Well, gentlemen, thank you for joining me today. I really do appreciate it. Um, let's dive right into today's topic, which is uh, licensing models. Yes, this is the, uh, the big bear that everyone keeps talking about. As we start shifting to a software-defined future, um, software is not something that is free unless you are an, a, a uh, convert to the GNU Linux community. Um, the rest of us still have to pay for things. And uh, one of the things that we're hearing here at Cisco Live is that the licensing models with the new uh, intuitive network models are going to change. And uh, we're moving to a, an operational expense or OPEX model where we have to basically rent things on a yearly basis versus paying for them once and they run in perpetuity until you know, something causes the software to fall apart. Um, I want to hear from, from the folks, uh, what are your thoughts on this shift to OpEx? Is this a good thing or a bad thing? Who wants to I'm not a big fan. Why are you not a big fan, Scott? Maybe it's just because I've been in IT too long and I'm not up with the newfangled stuff. I don't know, but I, was, I like to buy things and have them work until I decide I am done with them. I don't want to have to just keep paying every year. and may, and. I can envision there's people whose business models are different, and that, then maybe that would work better. But for me and a more conventional enterprise, I just it's it just annoys me that I have to keep paying to keep working running the thing that I already bought. Okay, it's coming from a, a conventional enterprise. Um, we're doing you know a five year capital project where these these assets are depreciating over whatever given amount of time and kind of throws everything uh, for, the, for the bean counters for a loop when we're, you know, doing a, a, writing a capital project that is really, you know, it's a lot the first year because you're buying hardware and software that first year. Then the amount changes based on, you know, the software licensing year two, year three, year four, year five. So um, from a traditional enterprise standpoint, it's really inconvenient for us because it kind of screws with how we do hardware refreshes and how we, uh, I guess, uh, work assets out of the enterprise. So let me ask you this question. So one of the things that you, you mentioned in that topic was is that traditional accounting cost structures aren't really set up to deal with the fact that, that there's one expense to purchase equipment and one expense to operate it. But we have those cost structures in place, just not for what we consider to be traditional IT. I mean, there's, a, there's obviously a budget to keep the lights on in the building. Right. There's a budget to pay the road maintenance for the building if, you're, if you have a private road, right? Those are just set up in different funds. So I think one of the things that, that not just Cisco, but a lot of other companies are trying to do is they're trying to shift those dollars around so that the capital budget shrink, because those are the big dollars that make people faint when they have to write those checks. But the operational budgets are essentially a set amount that's predictable. I mean, you could legitimately take the, um, the cost that you put into a capital expenditure project, roll it into an annuity, and pay out of that annuity for an operational cost over a certain period of time and effectively save money. So do, is, is, does that help change the shift in thinking from a traditional methodology to one that's you know newer and hotter, I guess would be a good way to put it. I. Without uh, actually working out the numbers, and, and, and that's a little bit out of what I do, yeah. uh, it, it's hard for me to answer that just as a network engineer. So. You're almost talking like a leasing model. Instead of where it's, it's an operational expense that's easier to appreciate in the first year versus a capital where you do it over three to five. Mm -hmm. 
So you really you're talking more of an operational expense versus a capital expense to, in order to afford things. But, but even talking about that, and, and I have to preface this by saying I actually took a lot of accounting when I was in college, and I hated it, which is why I don't do accounting now. Um, when you look at what we consider to be a, a capital asset, like, like a backhoe, for instance, backhoes are written off over a much longer depreciation schedule because the useful life of a backhoe without, you know, with proper maintenance is decades. Yeah. I mean, I've seen some backhoes that are older than I am that are still in, in production. But when you look at technology, I mean, that's the reason why we have things like double declining balance write-offs for accounting is because, you know, Jeff, for instance, your laptop, it's useful life. It's probably eight or nine years, but outside of that, I mean, how often do we refresh switches and things? You know, three to five years is not all that uncommon. So we want to write off as much as we can before we have we're forced to throw the asset out, essentially. So does that you know? Because when we move to a leasing model, as you put it, I mean, yeah, we're paying for that every year, but maybe that includes things like maintenance and upgrades, and even in some cases, I've seen hardware refreshes. Where as long as you're running our software. If your hardware gets out of date, we'll just ship you a new box as long as you're paying your maintenance costs for the software. Now, I've seen service providers running that model where they lease the hardware, they'll lease the chassis for X years and the internal modules for less because they know the refresh cycle so they can just keep maintaining them so they don't have to do big capital costs to uplift stuff. I have seen that. And most of the times, you're already paying these um, expenses anyway. so you. Like all of our software gets refreshed, everything is licensed on like a one three five basis already. Is it about time that we include hardware into that licensing and refresh cycle to where I'm not paying SmartNet every three years? Instead, I'm I'm just I'm buying the hardware and getting all the licensing that's that's included instead of having to pay support and hardware and whatever else. Um, and that way, I can have it as part of the uh, the whole cost structure, and I can. Tell the bean counters, this is what we're going to be doing. This is the expected cost. That's a very good point. We've already been paying for uh, operational expenditures for support for years. And maybe we just roll all this in and call it software now. And what about those times when you don't actually pay for the operational support because you it's cheaper to just buy a new one? But now with the new licenses, so like, for example, you have a whole bunch of low-end ISRs spread about a whole bunch of different branches, and their sole purpose in life is to be... Um, whatever the emergency fallback for the voice system um, is. SRST. SRST. Its sole purpose in life is to be SRST. If it fails, it's much cheaper just to pull it out and replace it than it is to put support in for all of those. And But if you have this subscription licensing model, now you're having to pay for something that you already paid for and you wouldn't have paid anyway. I mean, because if, if you're combining it with subscription, excuse me, if the subscription model is... is uh, Combined with support, there's at least some more value there, and I can I can go for that a lot better. But when we're having to get something extra that we wouldn't necessarily have needed before, then that's when I'm start to like this this is not a good thing. Or even worse, when we have a model that if you don't pay, the device stops working and turns into a brick. That one really annoys me. Yeah, and that's something that's come up. It's actually come up with me in the past as well because I run Meraki access points at home. And when my license got was up, I started getting the Nastygram emails of you need to update your license. And I didn't know what was going to happen because I've never let a license expire on a Meraki device. Does it keep running in survivable mode with no changes available? Or does it just shut off one day and my wife starts yelling at me because she doesn't have wireless left? How do, how do we handle that outside of an SMB? Because Meraki and a lot of other companies that have Support models like that are, are for, I won't say lower end places in the market, but they're more niche products for maybe like Soho, so Robo, Roboat, whatever, you know, the <laughs> smaller office organizations. <laughs> but if like if the core network of a service provider shuts down because you guys forgot to, forgot to pay the Cisco One bill this month, I mean, how, how, how does that impact things? That That's a material loss to the company, and that has to be reported if you're publicly traded. So how do we do that? From what I understand, the Cisco uh, Essentials license that they're kind of moving every, everything to does not stop operational when the license expires. It's your support. It's basically what your smart net is, plus you know an iSpace license and all that stuff that's kind of tossed in. Um, when that license expires, it's still fully functional. You just can't upgrade it. So in Scott's case, if you're wanting to run it as an SRST, and it's just going to be a box out there, and you're not planning on upgrading the iOS, you're not planning on ever 
uh, replacing it or anything like that, you just leave it out there and you let it do its job. And you better hope that there's never a bug that needs you to upgrade a lot. Exactly. Yeah, that's another good case. Like right now, if you don't have support on a Cisco device and there's a critical vulnerability released, you call Cisco, you get the escalation, you get the patch if you don't have support. What happens in the subscription thing? Are you, is that still a uh, viable option? Yeah, it's a good point because that, that's been a, a huge thing as of late. I mean, we're recording this in late June of 2017, and just today um, there was a FedEx went down because of a bug that was exploited by malware. Um, you know, what, what happens if someone writes a malware um, tool that can start taking down core routers? And you, you let the software subscription lapse on it, and it's just running basically in survivable licensing mode. And you've got to have that patch. I mean, are you going to be able to convince the software manufacturer to get it, give it to you without paying to make it current? Do you think some of this is because they want to decouple software from hardware? They want you to allow them to run their software on, say, white boxes, but yet you still pay for your licenses because now that they're separate, we can sell you your our software, iOS, Junos, Arista OS, whatever, Put it on your boxes because you already have a licensing model. We're built to do it versus saying, I can see that happening. I see that as a, like a roadmap thing, but I mean, you look at Meraki, you're not, no. whatever operating system is, is running on a Meraki switch or AP, I mean, at no point is that going to run on any other True, box. but that's, that's an endpoint operating system. Let's look at something that has a little bit more feature-rich, um, um, you know, service like let's just throw a name out there Viptela what if what if I can pay for a license for a Viptela box that runs not on Viptela hardware but in a VM or a container somewhere you know would, would it be worth it to continually pay that because I can move it anywhere I want I would agree if you have that kind of scale um, and typically those kind of companies that are worried about scaling up to that size to where we're literally depleting the world of that brand of hardware they could probably they probably have enough resources to write their own operating systems and do yeah. whatever they want. Um, I don't think that would be a very big use case. Well, and then as long as you've got the you know if, there, if in that case you know you're you're paying for a license to use the VM, but presumably in that case you're also paying for a license for uh, support and maintenance and stuff. And so then it, it's it's less of it feels less like buying a license than just buying a combo pack that concludes the license and your support, the support which you probably would have been paying for anyway. So I, I guess it just kind of depends on how much they're charging, see whether or not it feels like support you would normally pay for anyway versus an extra fee and you're just getting gouged. <laughs> but when you look at this, this is one of the things that we've actually, we've dealt with in the consumer tech space because I mean, half of the world runs iPhones right now, right? Forever, those were capital expenditures subsidized by somebody else. And when the subsidies stopped and people started looking at what the actual capital expenditure model for a phone is, they freaked. Because they're like, what, you mean I don't get it for $200 and I have to sign a contract now? But look at what the model that has evolved around that has become. Now instead of paying $200 plus, you know, whatever your bill would be every month, which is kind of like a license with support, now I pay a monthly fee like a lease but one of the things that Apple has decided to do is they've rolled in support. So if you buy an iPhone from the Apple Store and you use their, their upgrade program where you get a new one every year, you get Apple Care for free, which is something that most people weren't paying for anyway. So is that a model that you think should be explored? And, you know, and would it be useful for a licensing model like that to say, let's get a piece of hardware and you license all the cool software features and build on top of those, and in three to five years, when it comes time to refresh it, maybe it's not a lease, but maybe we'll give you trade-in value for the device to get like to the Nexus 9100. Are you making a product announcement? No, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, some, some, some kind of model like that where the hardware becomes less of the importance in the asset, and like Jeff was saying, maybe the software is where all the, the secret cool stuff is happening. I wonder if that's actually better for the end, end users because then you have support for the life of the product versus just buying the product and putting it away and just letting it be there and hoping it never breaks or you never need it. Because now if you have a problem, you have somebody to call regardless. You don't have to say, is that one under support? Is this one under support? You know it is. Yeah. I mean, I've done the same thing you've done. You, you put extra ones out there, you put spares out there, you put stuff you don't care about, but 
If it breaks, then you're scrambling to get it replaced. You don't have a support to call. Or if you're, if you're not there anymore, you're gone, moved on in your field, somebody takes over, are they aware of what you put it there for? Documentation or not doesn't mean somebody's going to look at what you wrote. That's true. And, and unfortunately for things like this, documentation is so key because what happens if the licensing model shifts in a year or two? And <laughs> or, we, we've already seen that. Or the person who got the licensing email and has the login to the support website leaves and then no one even knows how to get to it anymore. Yeah, that, that's happened to me. I'm the one that still gets licenses for things that are checked in and every once in a while on my old email address, I'll just get a random license file and I know now that I have to email it to somebody, but that would be difficult to deal with if you didn't know that that was a thing. I, so. I personally think it's the right choice. I think it's about time that we started moving away from a hardware plus smart net and then you go buy your software and then support for that software and all these other pieces that you need just to get your network up and running. I think the Cisco's already started with going to commodity hardware and um, we can start just buying a one license to kind of cover what we want to do, roll it into either into your operation expenses and you're, you're good to go. That way you have everything instead of having to buy a license and then that's one subscription and then your hardware has a, another subscription. Just roll it all into the one. I think you're talking more about simplification of the licensing model more so than subscriptions in that particular when scenario. When we start simplifying voice licensing, I'll agree. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I'm just saying not necessarily Cisco <laughs> in this case, but... I mean, I'm all for license simplification because we, we got way too many licenses and way too many variations. And I know that part of that is, um, you know, the attempt to, you know, it's like you don't have to buy, you know, you can buy the box and then you don't have to have all of the features turned on and then it makes the thing a little less expensive. But there's, there's got to be some sort of balance in there. And, and maybe it's like we make the box cheap and then there's a, some sort of simplified all-in-one licensing model um, which is sort of like, you know, we see that in like the Cis some of the Cisco One SKUs. I mean, we see like a controller is lists at 12000 that if you had bought it with 300 licenses, it would have been a $25,000 part. But it doesn't come with any licenses. And then you add your licenses and that includes everything. And then that starts to be more, feel more like a win because you're getting hardware for an inexpensive price. And then in this case, it's even decoupled from the hardware because then when you replace your controller, you still have your licenses. They're not tied to that piece of hardware. So those are the times when I'm starting to see, I feel like we're starting to actually get somewhere because um, your subscription is, you know, like a user access license. It's starting to sound a more like a Cal from Microsoft Windows. Yeah. Um, rather than being, I guess maybe it's the decoupling from the hardware and then, you know, eventually turning into a white box, who knows? But that's when it starts to feel like a win, when I'm actually getting some value out of making that choice, whereas some of them is just like, we just would really like you to pay us monthly for something that you thought you already had. And it's funny that you say Microsoft in that regard, because Microsoft has had that licensing model for years where the, se the server or operating system is separated from the user access licenses. But then you look at what they're doing with Office 365, where now it's essentially a monthly or yearly rental because that's where the, the money is. But what you're getting for that is you're essentially getting continuously upgraded Office. You're getting new features pushed down to you every month. Versus, well, you're on their schedule. Uh, exactly. <laughs> that and, is a downside. But what, what about you know what about a company that uh, is still running on Office XP because they don't see the reason why they should be upgrading to Office 2003? If you know somebody, let me know because I would like to pay them a visit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I completely agree there, and but I think that's that's a good point too. Is you know what happens when you get behind? If if you decide that enough is enough, and like Scott's example, I, that that SRST router that's sitting out there that never gets used doesn't need to have a, an updated OS. I mean, do you just hope that it's going to fire up the day that it needs to fail over? That's what the monitoring system's for. <laughs> All right, I think uh, I think we've solved all of licensing pro licensing problems today. <laughs> I feel I feel like this was a good talk, guys. I appreciate it. Now, um, you know, licensing isn't the easiest beast in the world to solve, and that's one of the things that network engineers and and professionals all across IT have to figure out. Is is software is becoming more of a thing, and we're going to have to spend a lot of our clock cycles trying to figure out how it's supposed to work. And uh, there are no easy answers, unfortunately, but. Um, 
you can find some easier answers if you keep listening to this podcast. You can always find the most current episode of the On-Premise IT Roundtable at gestaltit.com slash podcast. You can also find us on iTunes and in any one of your favorite podcast applications. Um, if you would like to go online and like, share, subscribe, leave a comment on um, the podcast, let us know how we can do better. Let us know some topics that you'd like to see addressed. We'd be more than happy to do that. Uh, but for now, for Tom Hollingsworth and the rest of the guests around the table, I'm going to bend you a fond adieu, and I hope to hear from you next time.